videotape you're going to watch contains scenes graphically depicting auto theft. It is not our intent to teach you to steal an automobile, but rather to show you how to secure your own. In order that we can do this, it's necessary to show you how quickly the standard anti-theft devices provided by the manufacturer can be defeated. Every 30 seconds somewhere in this country, a car is stolen. Half of those are never recovered. The man you'll meet in this video is an expert at taking cars that don't belong to him. Because of his expertise in his field, news organizations such as the Los Angeles Times, the Orange County Register, Orange Coast Magazine, and many more publications have written stories about him. He's 31 years old and has more than eight years in his line of work. During that time, he's taken any car a client was willing to pay for. As you'll see, he doesn't need the keys to unlock an automobile and drive it down the street. This includes yours. Hi, I'm Bill Banks, and I'll be your host for the next hour. I'd like to tell you a little more about Mr. Smith. He has a reputation for being very professional about his work. He started out taking old cars that weren't used for much more than parts and graduated to the best cars on the road, Rolls Royce, Porsche, and Mercedes. Because of his professional nature and expertise in his field, Mr. Smith will be showing you methods of taking cars that damage them the least, thus putting the most money in your pocket. We hope you enjoy the video. Hi, I'm Pierre Smith, and this video is called How to Steal Cars. What you're going to be learning from me in this video is how to break into Japanese cars, Fords, Chevys, Chryslers. I'm going to be showing you how to defeat their locking steering columns, and I'm going to be showing you how to assault lock garages. One of the first tools that you're going to need, and that's to break into the vehicle, is a Slim Jim. Most people are familiar with this in the auto trades. Uh, gets you into about half of cars, it used to get you into about 90%. Next tool you're going to need, you use this quite a bit, is a body man's tool called a slide hammer. This is a General Motors ignition puller. You use it on vehicles from 1969 through 1976. This item's called a General Motors force tool from 1979 through 1985 vehicles. You just place this on the ignition, turn it over the breaker bar, and you're gone. Hot wire, which is not really used anymore, there's a couple of places you can use it. Uh, it's a good idea to have one. You're going to have some simple tools, your ball peen hammer, needle nose pliers, channel locks, and a screwdriver. There are all, of course, other door opening tools, uh, tools to get you through ignitions. Uh, these are the tools I'm going to be showing you how to use. Uh, with that, we'll get started on our first vehicle. We're at Manchester Auto Salvage in Anaheim, California. Uh, when you don't have any experience uh, and you're looking to get started uh, learning how to use your tools and get into vehicles, a junkyard is an excellent place to start. Don't start learning this inside somebody's garage at 3 in the morning. That's not smart. The vehicle I'm using here is going to represent all our Japanese products. We're going to lock it up. The tool we're using is a Slim Jim. Just press it down inside the door. And I try to feel right here on the door where the key slides in. It kind of tells me when I'm banging around inside the door about uh, where I'm at. And you're in the vehicle. It's that easy once you know what you're doing. 
Uh, if you don't have experience and your tools are brand new and this is all brand new to you, go up and down the rows of uh, cars in a junkyard. Practice getting into some cars, practice getting ignitions out of cars. Uh, it's just a, it's a good place to start. You develop a feel. A lot of this job is just feel. Once you're inside of a Japanese vehicle, a couple of tools you need. You need your slide hammer and you need your straight bladed screwdriver to use as a key. Unlike other vehicles, you don't need to prepare this ignition. Just screw the slide hammer directly into the ignition. You want to get a pretty good bite on the slide hammer. Um, it doesn't have to sink all the way in like maybe a Ford or a Chrysler, but until it's snug or tight. Okay. All you do is you run this five pound weight back against the end of the hammer, and that's what uh, pulls the ignition out of the vehicle. We're ready to get started. This is what a Japanese ignition looks like um, after you slide hammer it. Calling this an anti-theft device is a bad joke. It just doesn't take long. Japanese car is probably the easiest vehicle to break into and take. Take a screwdriver and you'll insert it down here into the hole where the ignition was at. And you can steer the vehicle. You can put the vehicle into drive. If you are inside a garage at this time, I do not recommend trying to start the vehicle in a garage. What I'd like to do now is make a little point. This is uh, some philosophy. If you have a vehicle like this, you've extracted the ignition, you can make it roll, you can put the car into gear, you can steer it. Don't try to start the car inside of a garage. You should have backup when you're going to take a vehicle inside of a garage. And your backup should know all they have to do is push the car. They don't need to talk. They don't need to do anything else. They're backup. They push the car. Get this car out of the garage, get it down the street, and then try to turn the engine over. If this vehicle does not have uh, a coil wire, if they've installed a kill switch somewhere, maybe it's just screwed up, and you sit there and grind and grind that engine, you're going to get yourself caught, or you're going to make enough noise to get yourself hurt. That's not smart. It, it's 2 o'clock in the morning in somebody else's neighborhood inside their garage. You're on their turf. Get this car out, get it down the street, and get it started. The car we're going to be working on today is a 79 Plymouth Volari. Uh, we'll lock it up. The tool you're going to use to gain entry to this vehicle is a Slim Jim, like a lot of other cars. Pull the weather stripping back, and I like to feel where the key slides into the door. That's all it takes. You're in the car. You'll be able to start this car with your finger after I get the ignition out of it. You're inside the vehicle. First tool you're going to need is your simple flat bladed screwdriver. Insert it between the chrome facade and the column and knock it off. Okay, once that's off, well, we've got a uh, tungsten guard in the keyway. When you've got that, not all Chryslers have it. You're going to have to get a small chisel, and you're going to have to get a little hammer, and this ring that holds this guard in the keyway is what has to come out. Once in a while, you get lucky, and they're soft from being used quite a bit, and they'll just chip off. We got lucky that time. What you need to do now is take your slide hammer and screw it down into ignition. You want to get it tight or until the slide hammer, the sheet metal screw, has sunk all the way in to this ignition switch. And then you'll begin slide hammering the ignition out of the steering column. Okay, now that you have the ignition out in a Chrysler, I don't know if you're going to be able to see this, but the switch in here is so big, I'm able to hit it with my finger and turn the car over, and I can turn the car off. A Chrysler is about the only one you're going to be able to start with your finger, but it's something nice to know. You don't need to bring a spare ignition. You don't need a screwdriver. Just your finger.
After you've gotten the car away, you've gotten the steering column, or removed the ignition from the steering column, uh, the next thing, your, your best bet, is to put another ignition back in it. This type of ignition is available at most of your parts supply houses, like Pep Boys, Chief, um, any of the large chains like Cragen. It will come in a box. What you'll do is remove it from the little bag they put it in. What has the keys with it? One thing I do is I check to make sure the keys that they supply with it make the lock work. Now this is not going to be in the auxiliary position. The only thing holding this ignition in is this little spring steel clip right here. It's got a spring in back of it. Okay, this end is going to have to go over that large switch I told you about that you could hit with your finger. So the ignition lines up on the column and you just depress the switch once it's in there and work it through I need keys for this. There you go. Took a little bit of a shove. Accessories work. Good as new. Next car we're going to work on is a uh, Ford Fairmont. It could be Slim Jimmed. You could use the Ford Rocker Pick Set. I want to show you something different. This is just a tool that comes in one of the kits. And I've bent this one a little bit. Um, improvise. Don't always use the same thing. You don't have to get into a set pattern. There's going to be times you can't do it. So learn to use all your different tools and learn different ways to hit a car. On a Ford Fairmont, they have a hard door frame. And they've got weather stripping. So it's going to be easy to slip a tool past here and grab this door lock. Okay, the car is locked. Just get this round end and work it past the weather stripping. And once you're in, now sometimes you get it past here and it's not bent to the right angle. Use the door and bend it. You're in the car. It's that easy. Before we discuss uh, getting into this ignition, I want to talk to you about the slide hammer. Now, we've used this tool on the Chrysler. Um, I don't know if you can see it, but the sheet metal screw has become bent. Also, the end will become dull after you do a few ignitions with it. Ford ignitions are a little bit tough. It costs nothing. It's like two or three cents for a new sheet metal screw. Change the sheet metal screw after every time you do a car. Some guys will tell you, hey, I've done 10 cars, and they probably have. Um, but there'll be that time you're in a jam for three or four pennies. It's not worth getting in a jam. It's easy to do. And you're ready to go. Okay, we have to take this chrome facade off of the uh, Ford, just like the other automobiles. A little bit more of a push, and we'll have it here in just a second. Okay, now you got your forward ignition exposed. This little pin right here you can take out. They're real greasy and slippery. And you have a place to put your sheet metal screw on the end of your slide hammer. Screw the slide hammer into the ignition. Uh. 
Forwards can be really tough, and you want to get a lot of bite on that sheet metal screw. Okay, and I think that's enough. Now we're going to wrap this a few times, and the ignition will be out of the car. Okay, now we're ready to start the Ford. Take your flat bladed screwdriver, run it down here into the ignition. Got a few parts in the way. Get them. Okay. You want to turn the ignition switch over. I'm not going to be able to do it with a screwdriver because I knocked the sector gear out of the ignition. Normally, you'll take the screwdriver and you set it in the end here. And it looks like this one totally broke off. So I'm going to get a pair of needle nose pliers and I'm going to use that to start the car. This brings up a point. When you're working, uh, I, of course, I'm wearing comfortable clothes to do this film. Um, I'll demonstrate a jacket that I like and carry extra tools with you. Be ready for this kind of thing. In the middle of the night, in somebody's driveway, somebody's garage, any place, any place you're short on time, you can't be conveniently running back and forth to your truck grabbing tools you need. So come prepared. Okay, we're back and I have my needle nose pliers. I'm going to have to reach inside the column, and on this car, the teeth are going to slide frontwards, and I'll be able to start the car. And we've started our Ford. Something I want to point out on Fords, they have this wire that comes out of the steering column, and the car has to be grounded. Now, I grounded it with my pliers when I started it by keeping the pliers against the steering column. Once the car is started, then you can take the pliers out. I have something else I want to show you under the hood on certain models of Fords. This won't happen on every vehicle. This is the uh, starter relay. Inside the vehicle, you'll get the ignition switch turned on, and the starter motor won't engage the engine. There's nothing wrong inside the car. Leave the ignition on, come out, take this red boot off, and expose this piece of metal here. This is not a hot wire. Clamp on here, and then hit the negative post down here, and you'll be able to start the car. Hot wiring is a thing of the past. Uh, with transistorized ignitions, uh, computerized ignitions, and locking steering columns, uh, using a hot wire by itself just won't work anymore. But this is one place you're going to need to keep it. Uh, get the ignition switch turned on, come out here and jump it on this solenoid, and you can drive this car away. Again, we've gone to a parts store. This is another brand of ignition. And you can see the ignition is hooked up on this one. All we're going to have to do is plug it in, depress the small steel pin. Now forwards, turn the key, and then the pin can be depressed. And then it'll slide in, and you're back on again. First thing, there's about six Phillips head screws down here that have to be removed. Once they're removed, you can take the plastic shroud off the steering column. Now what we've done is to remove all the screws holding the shroud into the column. And this will make it pretty easy for us to work. This little part right here is what we have to take apart. I don't know if you can see this or not. But it's just a pressure fit part. It will give you a lot of room to work in here. Okay, now this is out. What you need is your new one, and it's just a plug-in part. Grab this and plug it in. Now we're going to put the shroud back together, and then the ignition goes back in the car. Now that we've got the shrouds removed and the ignition partially in, 
as I've showed you before. It's just going to take a good shove and playing with the keys a little bit and we'll get this car to start. Works every time. This next demonstration is going to be a Chevrolet Monza uh, 1980. Before I start, I want to show you another tool. I don't have a new Corvette to use or a Z28 Camaro, but the new ones that have the alarms built into their door locks, this tool will unlock the door and disconnect the alarm all in one movement. All that's necessary is the tool is placed on the door and made tight so that it supports itself against the door. Place your steel bar in and give it a quarter of a turn and the door will come unlocked. Of course, this is the wrong car to use, but it'll give you an idea of what this tool does uh, if you see one advertised somewhere and would like to buy it. Back to our good old Slim Jim. Put the weather stripping back. And we're inside that car. That wasn't too hard, was it? Okay, when you're inside of a General Motors, since 1979, all the GM sockets, all the GM ignitions, uh, have been able to start with the GM socket or force tool. I don't care if it's a truck, a Cadillac, a Chevette, if it's made by General Motors, Pontiac or Oldsmobile, whatever, um, this socket will start the car. Again, you're going to have to remove this chrome facade from the ignition switch. After you've removed the chrome facade from the GM ignition, you'll notice you've got a slot here and a slot here on both sides of the ignition. On the force tool, you've got teeth equally matching those slots. What you have to do is line up the teeth with the ignition, take a small ball peen hammer, and start by tapping one side, tap the other side, and then wrap it down real solid. Okay, once we've placed our ratchet inside the socket, and the socket's on the ignition solidly, pull back against it as you turn it over. Um, on this car, on this ignition, uh, the GM socket's not going to work. The method is correct. What's happened is somebody's already gotten in this car, and if you can see this, the edges are all chewed up. The edges on this ignition should be sharp, like on this other one I've already taken out. Therefore, the socket can't grab. A lot of you Sharpies are already figuring slide hammer it. Well, that won't work either. The General Motors people start putting a case-hardened screw through the ignition and through the column. If you tried to slide hammer this, you'd bust the steering column. And some people claim that they can slide hammer the guts out of the ignition. I've never tried it, and I don't recommend it. At this point, it's time to have a tow truck. Um, you won't be learning that from me. That service is available uh, for hire. Uh, and at this point, I'd say hire a towing service. Uh, they can do a good job for you. They'll get the car away, and then you can take the column down and remove the ignition. Uh, this vehicle we're doing here is a uh, 75 GMC truck. What I want to show you on this, sometimes you'll get a, a vehicle and they've got what's called a door sash or a window sash and you won't be able to get the Slim Jim down. Pull it out and put it on the weather stripping against the door like this and it'll slide right down. be in the truck. Something else I can demonstrate on this vehicle is the windowing tool. There's a lot of variations on, uh, of this tool. I made this out of somebody's car antenna. All you have to do is work the tool underneath the weather stripping in the window and flip the latch over and you can get into the windowing. Not all cars are that easy. Some of them have a lock back here when you get your kit, you'll have three of these tools in it. Use one to depress the lock, use another one to flip the handle over, and you can get the window open. It takes a little practice, but you can get it. We're inside the uh, GMC pickup truck. We're going to start working on the ignition. Again, you'll need a flat-bladed screwdriver. 
insert it between the steering column and the facade, give it a little turn, and knock that off. The next tool we're going to use is a GM ignition puller. This isn't the only tool you have to use, but it's the one I like. It goes on the face of the GM ignition, tighten it up a little bit, then use a ratchet, put your finger against the socket real tight so you can ratchet backwards, and it'll only turn one way. General Motors ignition comes out. If you can look down the column, we're going to use a pair of needle nose pliers. Just turn that little gear over. And start your vehicle. You can leave. I want to explain uh, what happens with this type of ignition. Uh, when the ignition is sitting inside the column, the tool is used and placed on the face of the ignition. Inside the tool, there's a lip. And on the outside of the ignition, there's a lip. The two fit together. When you start to tighten this nut back here, the collar can't slide past the steering column. The only thing that has to give is the ignition. If you can see this, the tailpiece on this ignition breaks off. There's just a small piece of steel that holds that in, and this, this ignition is made out of pot metal. And it's very easy. Uh, you just pop it out, and it'll all come out in one piece. This method works on 1969 through 1976 General Motors product be it a pickup truck like this one, a Cadillac, a Chevette, whatever it is, this method will work. We're going to install the replacement ignition in this General Motors product now. Uh, you won't have to depress this small piece of metal at the back end. The uh, ignition slot, hole in the column, whatever you want to call it, on General Motors is somewhat like a funnel. And all we're going to have to do is just shove the ignition in fairly hard. Uh, make sure your ignition is set to lock. You'll be able to see this little notch and it should match where it says lock on your column. Make sure you've set the sector gear inside the column in the locked position. Not the accessory position and not the on or running position. Just take your ignition and we just shove it in, get our keys, just like from the factory. Okay. What you're going to see us do now is assault a locked garage. You'll have to do this on many occasions because the vehicle you want is inside that garage. You're going to need your pair of bolt cutters. You're going to come up, cut the lock off that garage. You're going to look inside the garage establish that the vehicle you want is there and at that time take the lock and the bolt cutters and leave. Uh, at that time do not enter the garage. You'll come back and you'll get the garage open later after it's been unlocked, after you've hidden the bolt cutters and thrown the lock away. You want it a long ways away and don't bring the bolt cutters back with you. Bolt cutters are a burglary tool. Uh, you'd be guilty of a felony if you could be caught breaking and entering. If they catch you when you're taking the lock off, you got a misdemeanor, you got some petty theft, um, you got a nothing deal, you know, disturbing the peace. Uh, and if they catch you later, you swear to God that garage was open. So we're going to run through it, and the loudest sound you hear me make will be cutting the lock off that door. There should be no talking, and you should wear clothing that is comfortable, and it will not make any noise. We're filming during daylight. So, of course, I'm not wearing the heavy clothing I normally wear at night. You would want to wear dark colors 
So you can take advantage of shadows and hide there if necessary. You'd want a large, heavy overcoat uh, that you can hide the bolt cutters inside of in case neighbors might see you walking down the street. But this is best done at uh, 2 or 3 in the morning. So we're going to hit this garage, and there won't be any talking between myself or my partner because both of us know what we're going to do, and we don't need to talk. We've moved to the back of the house. Uh, if you can't gain entry through uh, the front door, the large garage door, come back here through the door that uh, most people walk through. This is all that secures most of these doors. Uh, all you need is a pair of channel locks and grab the shank on the door lock and just twist. And you'll hear it snap. Once it snaps, the lock inside's broken and you can open the door. That's all there is to it. For those of you who haven't figured it out, Mr. Smith was a car repossessor. Those clients who paid for cars were some of the biggest banks in the state of California. In this portion of the video, since we've showed you so many ways that somebody can get at you and take your car and break into your garage, we're going to start showing you how to make your vehicle and your garage much more secure, very inexpensively. What I have in my hands is just a common piece of 2x4 you would get off any construction site. You get two of these, uh, about this size, 12 to 18 inches in length, and after the door is closed, that means the hinge will come down slip the 2 by 4 in it when you're standing inside the door. The hinge can't back come back up past itself and the 2 by 4 You've made this door much harder to get into. Another method for securing your garage door are these simple bolts. Uh, you can purchase two or four of them. They're about a dollar and 14 cents each. And again, from the back side of the door, uh, drill a hole through the base of the garage door, the frame, and you'll have to rent a drill unless you just happen to have one that'll drill through cement. Remember, we're on the back side then, and you just drop the bolt through the frame and into the cement. With four of these bolts across the bottom of the door, that door isn't coming up. It's a very secure door. This is called an ABUS lock, and if you have the room, this is a much harder lock. Uh, the shackle that goes through here is much larger, and the lock itself, the body, is very hard to remove from the door. Uh, it's about a $14 lock. If Some doors don't have the room, but if you have the room, just a simple lock like that is better than the other uh, worded type padlock that we used. Now I'm showing you how to secure a garage. It's important to secure the front door. It's also se important to secure this small door that most people walk through. This is the normal size uh, flash plate, strike plate, whatever you want to call it, that most people have. Uh, this is OK for the lock that uh, is in the door. I would suggest going to a solid door if you have a hollow door, no glass and no masonite in that door, a solid door. Use a deadbolt. And at most locksmith shops, you can buy uh, this type of strike plate. This one was $9.50. Um, you can see the size difference here against the other strike plate. I don't know if you're going to be able to see a thickness difference. This is um, at least an eighth of an inch. And it'll sit up here. Uh, and it'll make your door much more secure. You'll be locked here, and you'll be locked here. 
And instead of using the type of uh, screw, most people use a, a wood screw about this size. And as you can see, it, it wouldn't sink in very far. Go to a wood screw that's this size, a good three or four inches. And it'll sink this plate back right into the frame. This will give you a very secure back door. What we're going to start doing this afternoon is showing you how to make your vehicle more secure. Uh, as you've seen, it's very easy to gain entry and pull the standard ignitions out. This is my 1987 Ford pickup truck. And we're going to begin by putting a lock technologies lock in the steering column. Uh, it's made out of a better quality steel than the standard ignition. This cap rotates. You'd have a hard time getting a pair of vice grips on it and turning the ignition. Uh, also, these keys, a locksmith cannot duplicate for you. You have to send the money and the key code to the company to get extra copies. Makes your ignition much more secure. What Rick from Bill's Lock and Safe is going to do for me is after this set screw is placed back into the ignition, is put a drill bit inside here and break it off so that it can't be removed and then the ignition taken out. So we're going to get started uh, and make my truck a lot more secure. In order to put the high security cylinder in this steering column, we're going to have to remove the existing lock. That's done by turning the key a quarter of a turn and depressing the retainer. Once the retainer is depressed, the cylinder will come right out. And we'll take the new lock and just go in the reverse, turning it a quarter of a turn, putting it inside, and turning it back. The cylinder is locked in place right now. What we'll do is we'll add the Allen screw to secure it even further. Once we've got the Allen screw in to secure the cylinder, we're going to test it one last time just to make sure that the lock is in correctly and it's going to work OK in this vehicle. Once we've determined the lock is working OK, then what we'll do is we'll break a piece of hardened steel. I'm using a drill bit at this point. Uh, break it off in the Allen screw so then it can no longer be taken out, removed. Now with that hardened piece of steel in there, there's no way they're going to get that Allen screw out. You've got a very secure ignition switch. What I'm going to show you now that we've uh, installed the new ignition is a system called the Page 4000, manufactured by Page Incorporated. Uh, what this does is to alert you when someone's trying to break and enter your vehicle. Uh, you carry a pager like this one. You'll have it on your person. You'll have it inside your residence. Anytime you're away from the vehicle. What happens is if someone uh, does gain entry to your vehicle, the pager goes off. What's happening is right here is a small microphone. If someone's trying to slim jim the door, the pager goes off. If someone does get the door open, the pager goes off. One way or another, you're going to know that someone's tampering with your vehicle, and then you can take some sort of appropriate action to uh, stop them, call the police, um, whatever the situation calls for. The next system I show you is going to be one to deadbolt the hood and kill the ignition. So if they do gain entry to the vehicle, uh, they can't start it and drive it away. The next system I want to show you is called a Chapman system. What it does is it deadbolts the hood when you depress the lock. This also cuts out your ignition. If somebody did break and enter your vehicle, if they did get your ignition out, I happen to have the keys. And you can turn this thing over forever, and it's never going to start. What's happening under the hood is the ignition has a switch in it. Once this is depressed, that switch activates, and there is no complete circuit. Your vehicle will not start when the Chapman system is on your vehicle. The next thing we're going to show you is how it deadbolts the hood. What I'm showing you right here is the portion of the Chapman system 
uh, the dead bolts your hood. Uh, when the hood is closed, this pin slides out of the, uh, I don't know, piece of, piece of the Chapman system here. This bolt slides out and through here. Uh, adjoining it is this portion in the hood. When the hood is closed, this deadbolt slides through it. So even if somebody did gain entry to your vehicle uh, and was able to operate the factory hood release mechanism, they do not have the key to release this deadbolt. And your hood still stays shut and they can't disengage uh, the ignition cutout portion of the lock. Another method I'm going to show you is how to secure your wind wings. If you remember how easily I got through them, uh, this is a wind wing lock. They're available fairly inexpensively, less than $10 a set. I've already uh, pre-cut my cork pad that's going to go against the window. You place your cork pad against your window and push the wind wing lock on. Then close the window. Slide the steel bar over to where it's closed and turn the nut on the back side. Now you can see the latch is already turned on this, so the only thing holding that window shut is this lock. I've opened a lot of vehicles and I've not yet found a tool that will turn this nut once it's secured. So you're secure here and your latch is secure here. Well that's our videotape. I'm going to do a little summation now of what you've seen uh, and some of the things we've covered. Uh, some of the things that I have shown you are the easiest cars to get into and the easiest cars to take ignitions out of. What I haven't shown you uh, are the hardest cars to take, uh, how to use tow trucks, how to impression keys, how to use wiring schematics available at public libraries. Those things uh, are more advanced and you'll learn them as, as time goes on. Uh, practice these things, get a job working uh, for an iron lot, that's a used car dealer. Uh, work as a driver for a car repossession agency before you actually start taking cars. You're, you're not going to go to the World Series and learn how to play baseball, uh, and you're not going to learn to take the toughest, hardest cars to begin with. So practice these things in a couple years. If it rolls, it's yours. Good luck. For those of you considering viewing this tape and possibly stealing automobiles, uh, the penalties in this country for auto theft uh, vary depending on how deeply you get involved, but you can go to prison for a long time. Stealing cars is not a good idea. Uh, for more information on how to prevent the theft of your own automobile or possibly to purchase products, uh, write to the address at the end of this video. Uh, in return, we'll send you the names and addresses of the manufacturers who can provide you with security products for your vehicle.